chairman sir ladies and gentlemen good morning actually i am the odd man out we have success stories we have spiritual leaders we have an extraordinarily organizational leader in front of us and now i have to do an exam you see normally i take exams in the university now i have to do an exam the exam is this i must move you from these wonderful stories success stories good stories into a rather depressing story the question is how can i do it and still catch your attention i don't know after the exam tell me please whether i have succeeded or failed i want to talk about two dimensions just dimensions of problems that face us our culture our society in, in here in this country and outside in a way you know these problems but in a way i don't think you quite appreciate the depth of the problem i just want to take two aspects You see, we have heard, we are facing the problem of proselytization, conversion of people, and I'll focus only on one religion which I have studied for the last forty years, Christianity. In some senses, I would say that is not a serious problem at all, because this is important. There is a far more insidious problem, far more dangerous problem. for more poisonous problem which is the other phase the second phase of the coin of proselytization or conversion and that is what i call secularization of christianity ever since the birth of christianity i won't bother you with the history there has been two phases to the expansion of christianity one is a well known conversion where people are converted into christian religion doctrine and practices but there's a second which today is the dominant form of conversion which is secularized translation of christian ideas which we all have accepted i mean every one of you has accepted in the name of science modernity rationality and so on this is secularization i will explain in the course of this talk with some examples this is the first problem that confronts us the second problem which has to do with 1000 years of colonialism both islamic and british because of which we suffer we all of us suffer from what i call colonial consciousness now these two together or in some senses perhaps the greatest challenges facing us especially our children in the 21st century world let me take four examples and i'd like to say when i give examples i'll be mentioning names but i'll not be attacking the individuals they're just to illustrate that's all they are not to give evidence of my claim but just to illustrate what it is you see the british had what they called the civilizing mission of in, civilizing mission in the world they wanted to civilize us let me just take two dimensions from that or four dimensions perhaps four aspects if you like the first is this they found that we were an immoral people we were a corrupt people that's one aspect ethical dimension if you like and they found that we were uncivilized and dominated by superstition you know all this you say why talk about it today you see this is where colonial consciousness comes in because today in the 21st century india 
India, we are reproducing all these four aspects with an incredible power, as though the British had never left us. Let me take an example. The British found us extremely dirty people, unclean people. The civilizing mission was that the government should teach hygiene to Indians, the colonized subjects. Isn't Swachh Bharat exactly that? Government teaching people how to be hygienic. What is the difference, if any, between Swachh Bharat and what British tried for 200 years to teach us cleanliness. Of course, our public toilets are very dirty. Of course, our public offices are badly kept. But I'll come back to it in a minute. But the point is the idea that it is a task of a government to teach hygiene to its people is one of the civilizing missions which the British carried over, carried out in India for hundreds of years. And we are doing it very proudly today. One dimension. Second dimension. The British found us incapable of ruling ourselves. They found us corrupt. They found us immoral. They found that we did not deserve the independence that we got, even though they were forced to give under pressure. Have situations changed? Today we all believe, most of us at least, that most politicians are corrupt. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. We found a party, Amadmi Party, to remove corruption from Indian administration and Indian politics. A section of us vote for them. I'm told 20%. We are convinced. When you go to patrol bunk, that will be cheated in the sense we won't get a full patrol. When you give a calls for servicing or smartphones for repairing under warranty, we are afraid that they won't do it properly and cheat us. We say, in the words of my brother, hum sab log chor, hum sab log chor hai. We talk that way in the streets every day about ourselves. Tell me, how are we today different from what the British thought about us? This is one aspect. Second aspect. Francis Xavier, the famous patron saint of the Catholics, wrote to the Emperor of Portugal, Your Excellency, he said, the only thing needed today to make Goa pure is to kill all the Brahmins. The British and the Europeans came and told us that Indian society, its religion, Hinduism, is backed by the most corrupt system known to humankind called the caste system. Today, Ambedkarites in Karnataka about 10 years ago it went on for more than a decade, went to the university classrooms, picked up Brahmin girls, raped them in the quadrangle, and sent them back to the class. Anybody who protested was beaten to death. Today, the same Ambedkarites, every week, go to the university colleges and tell hundreds of children, you young people coming from the villages, that Brahmins have to be killed and the best thing is to rape their women. You go to Bishop Cotton's College High School in the streets of Bangalore, you'll find written on the walls, all Brahmins must be killed. And they find exactly what the British found us, what the European found us, the caste system and Brahminism destroying India. How different are we from the British today? In fact, 
The extraordinary thing is, none of these facts are untrue, as I said. There is, so to speak, corruption. But the question is, what kind of corruption is it? We all say our politicians are corrupt. But do we know what it means to speak about corruption and why public officials should not be corrupt? We talk about public interest. They are not defending the public interest. But do we really know what public interest means, even if they put public interest litigation in the court? Do we have words for it? Swartha and Paratha don't translate it. Hitasakti do not translate it. But we say politicians should not be because they're serving the public interest. And we don't even know what public interest means. As I said, it is true. Our institutions, public institutions, like toilets, etc., are filthy, unkept for. But does that mean that Indians are dirty? We need a Swachh Bharat. It is true that one jati oppresses another jati in different parts of India, different parts of this society. Does it mean, therefore, we have caste system? You may say yes, but then I want you to reflect on one thing. The sun we see moving on the horizon every day. Does it therefore mean that the sun is rolling around the earth? In exactly the same way, and this is where I let my talk. It's true we face some facts, we see some facts. But the theories we're using to understand these facts are secularized Christian variants, which make our culture our people, our society, immoral, <coughs> corrupt, backward, and primitive. Chairman, sir, ladies and gentlemen, the challenge facing is simply this. Where is that independence that we're supposed to have had? <laughs>